Thank you for being with us online. Our desire is to journey with you however you want to connect with us. For more information about our church, visit us at OurJourney.tv. Now, here is Pastor Will Groskopf. So today we're going to pick up on our uh, armor series we're doing for the summer. For those of you that... Uh, uh, sorry, I was trying to read this prompt. I've realized it's not for me. <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, for those of you that are just coming in today to, to listen to this message... This is a part three of the series. We do encourage you to go back online. You can go on YouTube and you can go on Facebook and find them, find both the first messages. Uh, pastor John Richards, our online pastor over there. Hi, John. Is a uh, tag team in this series with me. So uh, the next the next four weeks or the next three weeks will be, uh, I'll, I'll do the next week one. Then Mr. John will do the next one. Then a good friend of ours, uh, Jeff Moran, will come in and do the last one. So we're going to close the series out for the summer before pastor comes back. And uh, so we are excited that he's coming back, but also we're excited that he's gone because he needs it. We got big things coming. We got big things coming and our pastor needs a must, much needed break. So uh, we love you, pastor. We just pray that you're having a good time, you and your family, and that y'all are well rested and well prayed up. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's roll with this. So today we're going to be talking about uh, the shoes for the preparation of the gospel of peace. That's one long sentence for one item, ain't it? So anyway, we're going to go ahead and do our same text that we've done for the whole series because all this comes out of the same, same set of uh, text. If you could open your Bibles to Ephesians 6. We're going to do Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. It says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Everybody say whole armor. Whole. That you may be able to stand. Say stand. Against the wiles of the devil. For our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, which means it's not against people. I know this, your brother and your sister is not your enemy. All right? But against principalities, against powers, against the world, world rulers of this darkness, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Say whole armor. Whole armor. That you might be able to withstand the evil day and having done all to just stand. Say stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your loins with the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, which is today's, and with all taking up the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the evil one, and take, on, take the helmet of salvation with the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's a lot for the armor. That's six pieces. I want to tell you, if you ever really go back and you study armor, that's not a whole lot of armor. There's a huge difference in Roman and Greek armor that's portrayed in the Bible and then what you would see in medieval times. Medieval times are actually covered head to toe. There's a lot of spaces not covered in Roman and Greek armor, which is covered in the Bible. And that's because you're supposed to put it on and never take it off. Never take it off. With these guys, they, they just only kept theirs on for war for, for the modern day armor. So... We're going to pick up where we left off. Like I said, we started off the very first one a couple weeks ago. I done, we covered the belt of truth. The belt of truth is very important because the belt covers your core. The core is the center of your body, where all your strength comes from. And as a Christian, the core or our center should be truth. What is truth? That's God, God's word. It should be at the very center of every Christian. And that's what needs to be protected, right? Next, last week, uh, Pastor John, he brought in... Uh, the breastplate of righteousness, righteousness, which is really good. A lot of people don't understand exactly what all a breastplate does. But I love the way he, he pulled it out. He's talking about we need to use it to guard our hearts. Not just guard our hearts, but keep our hearts from being hardened by outside influences. That was so good. I loved it. I loved it. And then today I'm going to talk about the third piece of the armor of God, which, of course, is the shoes for the preparation of the gospel of peace. And uh, a lot of people say it's just shoes. No, there's a lot more to that. A lot of people say it's just shoes of peace. It's not. It's preparation of the gospel of peace. So I'm going to have a model come up here, Mr. Frank Bordner. Everybody give a hand to Frank. All you men give a shout out to Frank's beard. Woo. <laughs> come on this side, Frank. I'm trying. I'm trying. See, I've been stretching it out. The only thing is I got a little more salt and pepper in mine than he does. But uh, Frank's been modeling for us, and uh, of course you can see why. He's got a physique. He's a man's man. He's a man's man. Hey, I got an ab too. It's just under all this. Okay. <laughs> all right. 
So we started off with the belt of truth. The belt of truth in, in, in uh, biblical times, the belt was done more like modern day MMA armor. And that's the reason why we're using this for our uh, um, purpose of visual because it's not a belt just to hold your pants up. Remember, we already discussed this. This actually protected, covered some things. So we're gonna put this belt of truth on him. Pose if you want to. And then last week, last week, Pastor John, he didn't get to do the visual because his word was packed so full of stuff. And I'm talking about good stuff. And he really didn't have a spot to put this in, which I agree he didn't. It was great. It was great. But this is the modern day breastplate. So we're going to put this on you. I don't want to mess up your hair or nothing. Oh, I'll get it. You're too beautiful. All right, just put your arms through here. All right, we're just going to tuck it for purposes. All right, so that's your breastplate. You can see what it does. It protects all his vitals right there. You want to give a swing at him, Josh? Okay. <laughs> the next one, these are the shoes for the gospel of peace, for the preparation of the gospel of peace. And I'm going to just lay these on here just for right now. So you can see how these go. This is your modern combat sports fight armor. Don't they look good, people? That's right. Give him in the beard a hand. <laughs> so for visual purposes, I like to do that because, I mean, if you could grab a hold of a word picture, you'll always captivate back in your mind, be able to pull something out of your memory banks and be able to say, I know exactly what he was talking about. So, Frank, I sure do appreciate you. I appreciate you. You can just take it off in there. I'm going to leave one of these with me if you want to take them off of your seat. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Frank. I love visuals. When I was a kid, I could learn a whole lot more from a movie than I could a book. Even though the, the movie didn't have half the stuff the book had. You know what I'm saying? So you couldn't really use it to cheat on a test. I'm just gonna tell you. Because there's a lot of stuff they left out that was important. And I think the people that wrote the test were the ones that read the book because they knew it wasn't in the movie. You know what I'm saying? Just gotta be careful of that stuff. Careful. All right, so like I said, it's the shoes for the preparation of the gospel of peace. That's a long phrase to describe shoes. And the reason it is, is because it's got five key, five key words in that phrase. Five. If you want to write these down, the first one would be shoes. The second one is preparation. The third one is gospel. The fourth one is peace. The fifth one I found was the most interesting, and it actually drew my attention more than all those. And it didn't step, stand out until I actually started studying for this word. And that's the word with. With. All the other words are it's really significant, but that word with really stood out for me. So let's break it down. Let's see why God included the shoes with the gospel of preparation of peace in our, in our uh, text. Let's see why he got it here. All right. We can all agree that shoes are important when you go to battle, can't you? Right. Nobody wants to kick or battle barefoot. So we all know it's important because we know that all battles and all battlefields ain't big fluffy pillows, right? We know we ain't just walking on soft ground. Anybody try to run on gravel barefooted? Yeah, it ain't fun. I don't care. It ain't fun. So shoes not only protect the bottom of your feet, but they also provide traction and grip. Traction and grip that you wouldn't normally have with just your regular bare foot. Everybody try to walk on a boat dock that's slippery and wet or a pool side. You know, there's a reason why they, don't, they say don't run at the pool, right? It's because it's slippery. You have no traction. But also, shoes provide protection for your toes when you kick, which is really important because when you're in battle, everything you got is a weapon. Everything. And believe me, if you ain't kicking, you're going to be screaming. So you're going to have to do one or the other. They're also important that uh, it protects your toes when they get stepped on. Also, shoes provide a hard sole for stomping. But what else? Your sole also provides a cushion under your foot so that you could, that you could endure long periods of standing. Because if you read your text, that's what it says. Having done all that you could do, therefore stand so that you could withstand. Shoes are important. Because through the process of time, you need to be able to stand and endure the time you have to stand. The second word is preparation. Preparation. Why is that important? Without preparation, we seldom succeed. Very seldom. There's no war today that goes without planning that America does. 
It's lots of people planning ahead before they ever say yes to a war, before they ever ever fire the first shot. When 911 happened, they they immediately got a good good group of people together to make a plan and then send them. It wasn't just go start shooting things. It's a plan. It, almost every battle you ca- you run into in the Bible is a calculated plan. Calculated plan. It's well said this. If we plan, if we fail to plan, we plan to fail. And that's true. That's true. So what does Webster say about it? Webster uh, Webster describes preparation as this. To put in proper condition or readiness to plan or to map out beforehand. That's the reason why preparation is so important. If we put on preparation, then we're already planning ahead for the day. I don't know how many of y'all do it, but I do it very often. I go through the day just winging it. But every single day that I start my day off with prayer ends up being a good day. Being a good day. I've got some brothers that send me texts, about three or four of them every day, with a different devotional. If I don't have time to, or make time to read my word in the morning, I can lean on those four or five devotionals right away and make it through the day just fine. Just fine. You got to be prepared. Habakkuk says it like this in chapter 2, verse 2. Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, that he, that he may run that reads it. Which means make a plan so that all can do it. So we got to do. Be ready. Make a plan. Luke, tw- Luke 14, 28 says this. For which of you desire building, to build a tower but does not sit down and count the cost, whether he'll have enough to even finish it? I mean, none of it, I mean, you don't do that with your own house. You can't even build a shed without even calculating the cost. You know what I'm saying? Our pastor's doing that right now. And uh, I like it because of me being a contractor, he called me up. Hey, Will, man, how much is it going to cost to build a shed? He gave me a, an outlandish price of like $7,500. And I said, no, it's going to be about three to $3,500. And then, of course, he was like, big question mark, sent the text. How's that? I added all the stuff up, sent it to him. He goes, dude, you're a genius. I was like, no, this is just what I do. If we constantly plan we won't fail we won't fail without preparation we're just reacting to whatever life sends us whatever life sends us now i'm telling you if we ain't proactive reactive is terrible it's terrible and you always find yourself doing things in haste and in rush and it ends up being another problem another problem the third word i want to talk about is the word gospel what is gospel what does the bible design, define the gospel as the good news. The good news. That's right. The living word of God. The good news. Why is it important to the honor uh, to uh, to the armor? Because the good news is the reason we fight. We fight for the good news. We fight for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We fight to spread the good news. Armor means nothing if you ain't got a reason or a purpose to carry it or to wear it. You got to have a goal. You got to have a goal. Nobody wants to go to war for nothing because there must be a cause. There must be a cause. There must be a driving force or a reason. There must be a hope for the better. And that's what the gospel does. It gives us a hope for better. We can all agree that the gospel is hope, ain't it? Amen? Amen. We can. Let's talk about number four. Number four, the word peace. When it comes to peace, why would you even have peace in the, in, in the armor of God anyway? Any armor built for war? So why would you have peace? Because peace is the end game. That's the ultimate goal. That's the ultimate goal. Peace only comes on the heels of war. That's it. That's all it is. You cannot have peace without having war first. It never happens. We have peace today, and we just celebrated it because of a war in 1776. We have peace today because we fought against tyranny. We have peace today because somebody had to use weapons to fight on our behalf today. Matthew 5, 9 says this, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall become the the sons of God. It did not say peacekeepers. It says peacemakers. To make peace means you have to have war. You have to. Most people misread that and they say peacekeepers. It's totally wrong. Peace is made through war and that's how it must be made. Peace is found when you've done all you know to do and simply stand. And withstand, just like the Bible says. That's when you find peace. 
Peace comes when you realize that the battle was actually his, and so is the victory, and so is the glory. You find true peace when you don't touch the glory. You find true peace when you walk in his victory. That's how you find true peace. True peace. A lot of times you hear a lot of people say things, you know, I just want to have peace and quiet. Peace and quiet. A lot of people, a lot of people strive for that, especially on a Sunday afternoon when you want to nap, right? Yes. But I can tell you right now, people confuse those two words. They confuse peace with quiet. They're two totally different things. Two totally different things. You can have quiet and still not have peace. And you can have peace and still not have quiet. Anybody know anybody that's confused them? I do. I do. It's like a spoiled child, a spoiled child that wants their way. And they get louder and louder and louder and more and more obnoxious. And then you're going to do everything you can to please that child. You don't have peace. All you do is make amends to keep the child quiet. That's not peace. That's not peace. Or you get with somebody, and I, I don't want to call ladies out because I've seen on both sides. But in my life, I've experienced this. I had a brother that had a wife that was super rude and super obnoxious. And uh, she was one of the ones that everything had to be her way, and she would just get louder and louder and louder. And, the, and it was embarrassing. You couldn't go anywhere with him. It was just super embarrassing. And then he would do all he can to please her to make peace. It didn't make peace. It just made her quiet because it kept coming back up. That's not true peace. It just made her quiet. But it made it obvious for everybody that dude went through some real hard times at home because he didn't have peace in his home. He needed to be a peacemaker. Sometimes he had to go back to war. You know what I'm saying? Because just being the loudest person in the room doesn't make you right. That just makes you a jerk, right? That's all it is. That's all it is. I find that a lot more and more today, especially those who claim to be really sensitive. People that claim to be really, really sensitive are usually really obnoxious and rude. They really, really are. I've come to realize that most of the people that have claimed to be very sensitive or very offended are also the most offensive people you could ever meet and the most insensitive. But we ought to understand that true peace only comes from God. We can't find it within ourselves. It really comes from God. Now, lastly, I want to talk about this last word, the, word, the fifth word here, the word with. According to Webster, this word means to be, to be in a company to, in addition to, to place alongside or to join as one. So why would the word with be important in the armor of God? I'll tell you why. Because without the word with, these would be just shoes. They'd be just shoes. In the Bible, it does not say just put on your shoes. Because we all know, especially in a woman's closet, shoes could be anything. They could be anything. So you can't go to war with just shoes. It'd be like going to a ballet wearing scuba diving flippers, you know what I'm saying? You just can't do it. You can't do it. So it, they are very specific. It says put on the shoes with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That's why it's so important. So important. We must be prepared specifically for the gospel of peace. And the reason, because naturally, most of us are prepared for war. We're not even prepared for peace. We're selfish. We're very argumentative. We want things our way. Want things our way. In reality, I'm going to just give you a big, big eye-opener to all you. Every one of you here are guilty of the same thing I am. We are all prejudiced. That does not make us racist. That makes us prejudiced. And why? Because we all come from different backgrounds. We all grew up the same, uh, our own different ways. We're used to our own things. Now you think about it. You go to a restaurant and you, you order fried chicken or you order a peach cobbler or you order your favorite meal and somebody brings it to you. It'd be really good, but somebody asks you, hey, how do you like it? Well, it ain't like mama made it or it ain't like mine because we are prejudiced. We know what we like we know what we grew up with. We know how we like things our way. You know what I'm saying? So we all have that. And that's a struggle we all have, but it's a reality. Reality. We are prepared for war, but we're not pre prepared for peace. All of us are ready to make a defense because we have all been hurt by somebody, used by somebody, stepped on by somebody. So we're prepared for war. 
We are not prepared for peace. If we was prepared for peace, peace, every one of us would have neighbors in our own neighborhood sitting on both sides of us right now. If we was prepared for peace, we'd have been inviting people. Because peace brings friendliness that war can't bring. We just watched that video on that, right? To make amends and do things, go, go the extra step, go beyond what we'd normally do. That's not even in my notes. Y'all get that free. Because <laughs> in reality, some people are not just prepared for war, but they're uncomfortable with peace. They're uncomfortable with peace. I have an ex-wife that she's doing good today, thank God, but I'm going to tell you, she, had, she grew up in a very chaotic house. It transferred to her life. She brought it up in a chaotic house. And when we divorced, she brought our child up in that. My oldest daughter was not prepared for peace. She, she was not happy unless something was going on in the house. Something had to be bad. And if it wasn't, she had to be the one to stir it up. People were, some people were just not prepared for peace. You're going to have to make it happen. you got to make it happen. Sometimes I can say it like this. If a person does not have peace, they do not have the peace of God. If they don't have the peace of God, you got to wonder if the good news is in them. Because the good news will bring about peace. Now, I'm not saying that people that don't have peace ain't Christians. I'm just saying they need more good news. They need to really reflect on, hey, what has God done for me lately? Because I'm going to tell you right now, all of us have a testimony, but everybody's testimony should be changing all the time. If you're only reflecting on what God's done for you 40 years ago, you got to wonder how close you are to God now. Because God is forever doing something. Forever. It should be new all the time. I thank God he, he got me to where I don't drink. That was 20 years ago. What's God doing now? You see what I'm saying? So I started this series, I was telling you on the very first day, uh, I used to teach an MMA class, loved it. I taught uh, uh, self-defense for years, loved it. I had a great class, I had 26 students. It was a pretty good mix. We had about two thirds boys, about a third girls. We had them all ages from children to adults. My youngest girl was three, she was in there. Uh, of course, she's just choking everybody because that's the only thing she wanted to learn. But it was funny, we, we taught all kinds of stuff. But when it come to, when it come to, uh, we did reverse order. So we started off with jujitsu, then we went to judo, then we went to wrestling, then kickboxing. Kickboxing was always last because if you're teaching kids how to kick and punch, that's all they want to do is kick and punch. And you don't want to teach kids that. You want to teach them more in the self-defense realm. So what we teach them when it comes to kicking is to focus on their legs, focus on from the knee down, because most people are not ever going to think you're going to kick them from the knee down. And we would do that because if you ever trained for a fight that had rounds, when you trained for MMA fights, if you start wearing them legs out early, they can't stand in the later rounds. They couldn't do it. You start, you start just kicking to the back of the calf constantly. And a lot of people don't know it. They don't even know that the only way to block a kick is to lift your leg up. It's very simple, but they don't know that. So their ankle's getting crushed and their calves are getting beat up. Well, then they can't stand in three rounds and the fight could go five and they're in trouble. So we taught these kids very, very quickly. There's three, three keys that we taught them. Hey, look, if they can't breathe, they can't beat you. If they can't stand, they can't beat you. And then the last one, if they can't move, they can't beat you. So it's always knock out, tap out, you know, make them give up. We always just done that all the time. We loved it, we loved it. But we'd teach them everything we could about attacking the legs. And one of them is most people have an arched foot. Very few people have a flat foot. So we'd teach them, you know, when you're tied up with a man to stomp their foot. Because if you stomp the foot, the top of the foot, you could break their arch. Or stomp their toes. Nobody likes their toes getting stepped on, do they? No. I do in church. I want somebody to speak to me. You know what I'm saying? Step on my toes. I almost preached in cleats, but I don't own none. You know, it's hard to find 14s in cleats. So. <laughs> but anyway, so those same keys to life that are in our physical, our physical world should be the same in the natural in the in the spiritual world. You know, if the enemy cannot move, he can't hurt you. So give no place for him. If he cannot breathe, if he cannot speak life, to, uh, speak death to you, he can't hurt you. Amen? If he can't do that. And if he can't stand, if he can't walk with you, he can't hurt you. That's the reason why you need the whole armor of God. And then you need brothers and sisters with you that are armored up too. You need people watching your back. You need it. So these three keys we're going to need for our spiritual world as well. One, you've got to put on your armor. 
Now we've covered it in the first week, you gotta put on your armor. Not your parents' armor, not your neighbor's armor, not your friend's armor, your armor. You know, remember uh, David tried that with Saul's armor to fight Goliath, it didn't work. He never, never wore that armor before, he wasn't comfortable in it, it was too big, it didn't fit him. You gotta wear your own armor. Number two, you gotta train in your armor. David was uncomfortable because he didn't wear it at all, any. He never practiced in it, he didn't fight in it. And I'm gonna tell you now, you gotta practice like you fight. Wide open, all in or nothing, so that you're prepared for the day of fight. And then three, make your stand. You gotta make your stand. Like the Bible says, having put on the full armor of God, the full armor of God, doing all you know to do, therefore stand. So you stand so you can withstand. Stand so you can withstand the wiles of the enemy. Today we stand for freedom. Today we can stand to make our own peace. Today we can stand for the good news that Jesus Christ has done in our life. We can prepare for peace today. Anybody else ready to do it? Because you got to be ready. You got to plan for it. You got to plan for it. Let's all stand. We look forward to doing life with you. Now, let's go this week and be the church in our community as we focus on loving God and loving others. See you next week.